your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. The senseless man does not know. Fools do not understand that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. For surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have exalted my horn like the wild, like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of wicked foes. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship, to praise, and to magnify your name in this place. For there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved but the name of Jesus. That's your word, Lord. That's why you walked among us. You condescended to become a man. Lord, as we open your word and want to speak from it this morning, we ask for your light to be shined upon it. That, Lord, you would give revelation. Lord, that the preacher wouldn't just have some good ideas, but, Lord, the Holy Spirit would take over and speak into lives. Give us revelation. Let your light shine on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you here this morning. And uh, if you are a visitor here and it feels a bit weird, that's okay. Scripture says that Christians are peculiar people. And uh, so, but we hope that you feel God in the house. We hope that you feel welcome and part of the family. And if you are, if it is your first time here, put your hand up somewhere or after talk to somebody because there's, I know there's at least three, Ivan, Linda and Raylene my relations, and um, you can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relations, somebody said. Works both ways, I realise that. Um, but yeah, we've got uh, visitors packs down the back there, and it'd be good if you took one of those, because you'll get a free cup of coffee and a wee crunchy bar, so that's always good. So, I get the, ch- I get the opportunity to preach again, and I only had three coffees this morning, so I'm not bouncing all over the place like I did last week. In fact, I'm going to try and put my teaching hat on this week. No, it wasn't last week, whenever I preached last. Didn't Paul do great on 50% last week? <laughs> Seemed like 100% to me. It was pretty good. So that was great. And we're in a series called Flourish. And uh, that psalm that I read to you just now is Psalm 92. And I read it for a particular reason, A, because it's about worship and praise. And in fact, it's the only psalm out of 150 psalms that says it's to be read on the Sabbath. And... Um, there are, uh, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, there's a thing they call midrash. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. But it's a, it's a way of Hebraic interpretation. And their tradition says, would you believe this? It's a romantic idea. And I like to believe it because the Hebraic uh, scholars says it so. They're talking about Hebraic scriptures. They're talking about a Hebraic tradition and uh, their own faith, and they say that Adam recited this psalm. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's got nothing to do with my message. I just thought that was really interesting. So, and you can have that for nothing. That sort of thing just spins my wheels. I think, goodness, I didn't know that. So that was great. 
Anyway, and it's a psalm of praise, of worship. It's a psalm to be read on the Sabbath. And it starts off with, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. Anybody disagree so far? No? Good. We're on the same page. Hallelujah. But I'm not going to focus on that verse. Actually, I'm going to focus on verse 12. And we're in this series, as I said, called Flourish. And this is what verse 12 says. The righteous will flourish. I'm going to stop right there. The righteous will flourish. Really interesting. The righteous will flourish. Are you flourishing? Do you feel like you're flourishing? That word flourish comes from a word called parak in the Hebrew or porak. And it actually means to bloom, to spread your wings. And this is a bit that I really like, specifically to fly, to fly in the spiritual realm, to fly in the kingdom, to be above and not beneath. I like that concept. And so I've called my message this morning, Learning to Fly. So let's learn to fly together. The righteous shall flourish. We can get a God's eye view. And the God's eye view of the world and our circumstances and life is what we really want. Because, you know, we walk in a, what, I think they call it linear, don't they? Is that what they call it when you're just sort of walking along and all you can see is this dimension that we're walking in? You can't see what's in the next block. You can't see anything in detail way up ahead of you or you can't see way behind you. You can't see over that way. You can't see this way. You can only see where you're walking. But if you've got a God's eye view, you can get God's perspective on what's going on in the earth and in your life. And you can see, the, get the answers to circumstances. You can see what's coming. Some things we don't want to see coming, mind you. <laughs> we just deal with it when it gets here. But anyway, God's got your back is what I'm trying to say. And so when it comes to flying, I heard a guy talk. Any pilots here? No pilots? Oh, good. So if I get it wrong, you don't know. Um, so, so I heard this pilot telling a story about flying. And when you're flying, uh, there are, you, you, when you're learning to fly, you have to have a stage where you learn to fly by instruments. Because there are times when you're up in the air when you don't know up from down. You don't know... Uh, your feelings can be telling you that you're flying like this, which if you keep flying like that, it's eventually going to take you off course. And so when you start to fly like that, when you start to fly blind, you have to trust your instruments. You have to, against your feelings, you have to side with the instruments against what you're feeling. And in the same way with the scriptures, when we're feeling something and it's not godly or it's not what we, you know, it's not a nice feeling, we have to then trust the scriptures, and not our feelings, because the scripture never changes, amen? The scripture is always true, even if I'm not. So, we're talking about the righteous shall flourish. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel very righteous. I have moments. I'm sure there's people in here right now that could tell some stories. But you can shut up. Um, <laughs> In the nicest possible way. <laughs> so sometimes we need to side with the truth against the feelings. And here's the truth. Hey, look, I've written on my notes here. Slow down, Merv. <laughs> so here's the truth. Christ is my righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6 says this. In his days, whose days? Jesus' days. Judah will be saved and Israel will live safe, in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, talking about Jesus, the Lord our righteousness. That is Jehovah Sidkinu, the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6 says that our righteousness, our earthly righteousness, our good works are as filthy rags. In Romans it says that uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All doesn't leave any room, does it? I mean, it's all. And um, here's the thing. Jesus was sent to fulfill all righteousness. And what that meant to the religious Jew was that Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. Jesus didn't do it for himself. He did it for you, and he did it for me, and he did it for his people. 
the redemption that is brought by Christ is not just restricted to his death on the cross. I've written in my notes, Sila, so I'll repeat that. <laughs> Jesus' redemption is not restricted to his work on the cross. Let's think for a moment. Jesus didn't just have to die for our sins, he had to live for our righteousness. And this is a really important piece to get because Jesus was always righteous because he was divine. But when he put on flesh, when he condescended to become a man and God walked among us, he was walking in a fleshly body. He had to do earthly righteousness. He had to obey every jot and tittle of the law. And the Bible says that he was tempted as we are tempted, yet without sin. So that righteousness that he lived got credited to us. Not only, so it's a, it's a twofold creditation. So because of the cross, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he removed our guilt. He left us sinless. This is pretty good stuff. This is good news. He left us sinless in the sight of God, but he didn't leave us righteous. Selah. We would be innocent, but we wouldn't be righteous because we have not done anything to obey the law of God, which is the righteous requirement of the law is to live the law and not break any of the law. And we couldn't ever do that. Jesus, when he walked the earth, made it even more difficult. He took the Ten Commandments and said, they say this, but I say this. And he made it even more difficult. And the reason he made it more difficult is so that you would understand that you can't do it. You need somebody to do it for you. And Jesus did it for you. He did it for me. There is a theological term uh, talking about Jesus' obedience. It talks about his active obedience and his passive obedience. In his active obedience, Jesus walked in righteousness in the earth. In his passive obedience, he went to the cross in silence and in obedience. And he did it for you and me. It's real quiet in here. I'm hoping that means you're catching what I'm saying. His act of obedience refers to the whole life of obeying the law of God, whereby he qualifies to be our Savior. Jesus qualifies to be the Lamb without blemish. He qualifies for the song in Revelation that worthy is the Lamb. You and I are not worthy, but Jesus has made us worthy. Jesus qualifies to be the Lamb. And Jesus wants me to understand, he wants to know that his righteousness is part of a twofold salvation, a double impart imputation. His righteousness was imputed to me, credited to me, and my sin was imputed to him and credited to his account. So he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. And he does the same for anyone that believes. And believing is a really important thing. And I reckon that that is good news and good news indeed. Jesus, I like it, clap for the Lord. That's awesome. Jesus' life was one of perfect obedience and it was just as necessary for salvation as atonement on the cross. My sin to him, his righteousness to me. And if we're going to flourish in the Lord, if we're going to learn to fly, we have to start putting our faith in his righteousness and not in our works. I'm not saying don't do good works. I'm saying put your faith in his righteousness. Our faith needs to declare that he is righteous. Because righteousness, his righteousness is a gift and not a reward. Romans 5.17, For if... By the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign, I've added fly, flourish, bloom, in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. See, many people often, through no fault of their own, have grown up with this concept 
And I know that it's true because I used to have this mindset as well. This mindset that if I'm good, I'll get good. If I'm good, you know, when it comes to heaven, you know, when I get there, you know, God's going to weigh up my good deeds against my bad deeds, and I've got my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Sorry to take the microphone away, Sam Mountain. Sorry about that. <laughs> if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I qualify for heaven. Have you ever seen The Last of the Summer Wine? Program on TV. I love that program. Well, I was watching an early episode of that, and they were in this old derelict church. And I don't know whether the, that was staged as a, they created that thing for the program, or whether it was an actual derelict church, and, you know, with the old furniture and stuff all broken down inside. But I noticed that there was a, a plaque on the wall. And this is what it read. In memory of Canon Thomas Jameson, born 1872, died 1948. Could have been a real person. And this is the legacy he wanted to leave to his church. Fear not to die. Learn this of me. No fearing death, if good you be. Can I suggest to you that that's really bad theology? That is really bad theology, but that is the theology that the church has been teaching, and that is why people think that they can get into heaven because of their good deeds. That is why I feel guilty when I don't do what I know I should do. Because I've somehow disqualified myself now because my deeds are not good enough. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we gain access. And by the way, heaven is not the goal. His kingdom is the goal. Relationship with the Father, a restoration, coming together with the Father and understanding and knowing Him is the goal. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. But that's the goal, not heaven. Heaven is an accidental it's just one of the benefits of getting connected back to the Father. That he goes and Jesus goes away to prepare a place for us that we can all get a mansion in the sky. I'll fly away. No, let's not start doing that. <laughs> Living now. I need Jesus now. I need his righteousness now. I need to walk in his righteousness, not my righteousness. And that doesn't mean I can do what I like, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Last of the summer wine. It's not our good behavior that gets us there. But many churches have taught it, and it's not true. The Lord is our righteousness. His righteousness is imputed, credited to me. I did not earn it. And it's credited to those that believe when they believe, the moment they believe, when they have faith in the righteousness of Christ. That is the object. Philippians 3.9 says... And be found in him. Where do I want to be found? I want to be found in him. Jesus, you know, when he talked about coming back to the earth, there was one thing that he said. He didn't say I was coming back to see good theology. He didn't say I was coming back to see if you'd been a good boy. He didn't say, oh girl. He didn't say I'm coming back, you know, just to put things in order. He said I'm coming. Well, he did say that. But he didn't come back for a lot of peripheral things. He came back. He said, when I come back, will I find faith in the earth? Faith, faith in my righteousness, faith in what I have done on the cross for you. It's nice that you've done stuff for me, but it's not about what I've done for him, it's about what he has done for me. It takes the focus off us and puts the focus on Jesus. It's credit to those that believe. There is no true faith that is justifying faith which has not the righteousness of Christ as its object. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but what, that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I just sounded like my oldest son right there. I just thought that was, maybe he sounds like me, that's all right. Anyway, James 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. Do you want to be God's friend? Put your faith in Jesus' righteousness. That's how you become friends with God. Receive his gift and be grateful for it. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses, one of the verses that I quote off to myself. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the King James says, in Christ. If I am in Christ and Christ is in me, I am righteous. I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I am a slave to righteousness. My flesh is a work in progress. Somebody said to me, because I quoted that scripture, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And a friend of mine said to me, yeah, but you're a work in progress, Merv. Well, yes, my flesh is a work in progress. But my spirit, if I died now, I wouldn't be more righteous in 20 years' time if I lived longer than I am right now spiritually speaking, but I am growing from glory to glory. <coughs> Excuse me, the water's way over there, it's all right. Phil, could you bring that to me? Thank you, you're a gentleman. I want you to think on those things for a moment while I have a gargle. <laughs> Hallelujah, where was I up to? So I'm, I'm nearly there, folks, so stick with me. I hope you're still with me. Yeah. Growth in the Spirit is a byproduct of being in Christ. One man said, if you, you know, even when you're going through hell, you know, and it doesn't feel like you're very righteous and things don't feel like they're going your way, one man said, if you feel like you're going through hell, just keep on going. You know, don't stop, don't pause, don't camp, don't get sat in hell, don't start feeling sorry for yourself, don't say it's never going to get better, I'm doomed. No, you're the righteousness of Christ, and Christ uh, you're righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And there is a victory, and the victory is in Christ, and He has won that victory for you. So you might feel like a loser. You know, like when you uh, buy a lotto ticket, you know, and it goes, you're not a winner. I'm not pointing at anybody. <laughs> they stop buying and they give me a complex. When you believe it, you are really starting to fly. Hallelujah. God's righteousness is a gift to you. A gift is something you receive. Once you receive it, it's credited to you. It is not a reward for good behavior. Christ is our righteousness. I know I'm repeating this, but I want you to get it. The benefit from it is you, to benefit from it, you must believe it. When you believe it, you're really starting to fly. And here is the challenge. Christ wants me to live in his righteousness. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And if you want to know what all those things are, read Matthew chapter 6. Do you want to flourish in God's kingdom? Do you want to blossom? Do you want to break forth? Do you want to bud? Do you want to fly? Do you want to grow? Do you want to spread your wings? Do you want to spring up? Seek his righteousness, not your own. When we depend on his righteousness, that which has been credited to us, gifted to us, then we are not easily moved in rough situations. When we can boldly say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, even when I don't feel like it. If we put our hope in our own righteousness, our good works, it becomes a tool for the accuser. I'm not good enough. I didn't do it right. I didn't do this. I, well, that's right. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus lived a righteous life. That's why he died on the cross. So that you don't have to. He did say you've got to die daily. He did say sometimes you've got to deny yourself. He did say that if you choose me, there are some people that are not going to like it. There are some people that are going to pick on you. And I know I've said that in my last message, but it's really important. If we put our hope in our own righteousness, then it's a tool for the enemy. And truth be told, we give the enemy a lot of ammunition. You don't have to say amen to that. So living in his righteousness starts with renewing your mind to his righteousness. You know, I used to think that the book of Romans was all about sin and my sinfulness and, you know, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But, you know, if you read the book of Romans, you'll discover that it's actually a book of righteousness, his righteousness attributed to you, that you can walk in his righteousness. And the thing is, we get ourselves focused so much on our sinfulness that we miss his righteousness. And the thing that you focus on most is the thing that you'll reproduce most. So stop thinking about you and start thinking about him. Stop thinking about your sin and start thinking about his righteousness. And if you put your focus on his righteousness, you'll start to reproduce his righteousness because your focus is on him. 
He's really not pointing the finger at you. You know, I used to think God had a big stick. I really did. I used to think he had a big stick. And every so often, he'd let me go my own way. And then he'd go, slip the stick out, and I'd trip over and smack my face on the curb. <laughs> but that ain't God. He will let you go and have your own way. But he'll say, you'll be back. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Go on then. And um, so... Focus on Jesus and his righteousness and not on your sinfulness. So what are you saying? Maybe you're saying I can go out and sin and do what I like. Well, if that's what you're hearing, you're not hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. <coughs> We've got to honor his gift of righteousness. Philippians 2, 27. The first part of that verse says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And if you muck it up occasionally, it's okay. Because Jesus says you can come back, repent, and you're forgiven. Pure and simple. But there's always a danger that some people hear a message like this, and they take the phrase, the righteousness of Christ. I am the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is credited to me. And they're doing all that as a cover for their own unrighteousness. Here's what um, my old friend John Wesley, anybody heard of John Wesley? Good. Well, if you haven't, you ought to make yourself familiar with John Wesley. John Wesley said this, and he lived in the uh, 1700s. Such a person can be as far from the practice and spiritual fruit of a Christian, so void of the mind which was in Christ, and not any res in any respect walk as he walked, yet have in their own mind the armor of proof against all conviction and what they call the righteousness of Christ. And in so doing, they make Christ the minister of of sin. So if you think you can do what you like, because the scripture says deny yourself. You don't, you're not, not because you've got to work your way to heaven. No, because you're choosing you're to be married to Jesus and to honor that relationship by not having a wandering eye, by not doing your own thing, by compromising a little, by working together with God. He says if you, uh, you know, if you, um, God will give you the desires of your heart if your focus is on him. And that doesn't mean all your wrong desires. God is for you. Anyway, I'm nearly done. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to bore you. If I'm too late, then I'm sorry about that. I implore you not, I implore you not to use the righteousness of God as a means to make Christ the minister of sin. The band can come up now, if you wouldn't mind. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says again, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And if you've got a Bible, I'm not sure, I don't think that I've got this one on the overhead projector. Or, no, that's not what we have these days. What do we call that? <laughs> Multimedia? <laughs> Go to Luke chapter 15 anyway. Luke chapter 15, somewhere in here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Anybody in here got a Bible? I don't hear any paper rustling. Matthew, Mark, Luke 15. Oh, I already had a marker in it. I don't know why that was so difficult. And here's a parable, the parable of the lost son. I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Most people know the story of the parable of the lost son. Eventually, the lost son came to his senses, it said. And he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, that's a really good phrase. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. That means that the Father is constantly looking for your return. He's constantly looking out to see when the son, when his daughter, they're going to come home. I just know they're coming home. They're going to come home. He's looking out. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. 
he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. That's so good. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son or your daughter. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Have you heard of the robe of righteousness? Where you see robe in the scriptures, it's usually a reference to Jesus' robe of righteousness. For all that that son had done, rejected his father, gone off into the world, taken his inheritance, done his own thing, squandered all the money, but the father was still looking out to see if him, to see when he would come home. And when he came home, what did he do? The first thing he did, he embraced him. He's looking to embrace you this morning. And he's looking to put his robe of righteousness on you. There's no fear. You can come back into the house. He just wanted to come back and be God's servant. You know, feeding the pigs out the back. I'm not worthy to be your son. But God says, the father says, no, you are my son. You are my daughter. I've been waiting for you. And I wrap my robe around you again, fresh. That psalm opened with Psalm 92 opened with it is good to praise the Lord. Here's why it's good to praise the Lord. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Do you know the Father knew you were going to be here today? I kind of believe myself that as much as I've put preparation into this message and I didn't get as much time as I'd have liked to sort of have it flow the way I would like, but I still believe that God gave it to me because He wanted to speak to you as He's speaking to me. And He knew that you were going to be here. And He saw you from a long way off. And He's running, He's running to embrace you. And my challenge to you this morning is, will you embrace Him? Will you embrace Him and be clothed with Christ's robe of righteousness? Let's pray. Father, we repent right now for every time in our life where we have doubted You and tried to depend on our own righteousness. Lord, help us today to recommit living in your righteousness, to walk in such a way as to bring glory to your name. We thank you, Lord, that you were willing to have our sin credited to your account. And Lord, that you walked in such a way, such righteousness on earth, that your righteousness can now be credited to my account, to our account. You, Lord, on our behalf, kept every jot and tittle of the law and credited it to us. Lord, that is too wonderful for comprehension. It's too marvelous for words. We thank you. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you stand this morning? And I want us to pray together again for those that may be here this morning and have somehow been spoken to in this message and feel a little tug of heaven as I did many years ago. And I... I, I Thanks so much for tuning in and watching our online service today. My name's Jake. I'm one of the team here at Eastside C3. I'd love to invite you to pray with me today. If you'd like to, you can just follow along and read the words off the bottom. So let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you today to become my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on a cross for me and I believe that you rose from the dead you did this to set me free from the power of sin and death today I turn from sin and I turn towards you today I believe that you are God please fill me today with your Holy Spirit to lead me, guide me, and teach me. 
and help me to follow you. Today, I become a child of God. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, congratulations. We would love it if you ever wanted to come down here. We're here at 269 Hills Road in Marty House, Shirley Christchurch. We are on 10 a.m. every Sunday. We've also got programs for young people and youth, and we've got tons of connect groups that meet all around the city. Thanks again for watching today, and have a blessed week.